Hi, and welcome to Physics Fundamentals. I'm your host, Angie, and we're back with Jim. This is part two of Why I Chose Physics. Jim, yes. welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Angie. All right, so in continuing with our conversation, um, you have also, I, I read this online, that you've also published with high school students and undergraduates. Tell us a little bit about that. So yes, uh, I'm someone who uh, has a sense that young people can contribute amazing, uh, I I amazing contributions if given the right opportunities and pathways. So yes, I published uh, work in string theory effectively with uh, even high school students and undergraduates. Mm -hmm. And it happens because I created a program that would be the pathway that would allow this to happen. We've been doing this for about 20 years. It's got an acronym that makes it unpronounceable, but it's a Summer Student Theoretical Physics Research Session. <laughs> and that's how I, I interact with young people. I think that's wonderful, because there are very few um, professors, physicists who are doing this. So. I think we're actually unique. I am not. Yes. I'm not aware of anyone else who does uh, something like uh, SSTPRS. Right, right. Now, since we're talking about published papers and so forth, tell us a little bit about your research. I found it very interesting what we sure. when we talked before. Yeah. So you know, uh, most people have the sort of impression that when they look at the mathematics, it's impenetrable. It's like a foreign language, and mm -hmm. in fact, it is a language, which is quite remarkable when you use mathematics the way I do. You understand it's a language, but there are problems in my part of physics that have been unsolved for 40 years. And so, uh, up until recently. So, about 15 years ago, I decided that if some of the smartest people in the world can't solve this problem, it means that they're asking the wrong question. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes, the solution to a problem is to write the, ask the right question. So instead of looking in, at, a, at a dense uh, forest jungle of mathematics, along with a, a scientist by the name of um, Michael Fox, we decided that instead of looking at this obtuse mathematics, maybe there was a way to visualize this mathematics in terms of pictures. And so we were able to find sort of a Rosetta Stone that mm. turns mathematics into pictures. And why is that important? Well, if you stop and think about music, which is accessible to everybody uh, who can hear, but music also exists as a set of scores. And so you can see music actually has two different presentations, mm -hmm. scores versus uh, the actual performance. What we did with our visualization is bring that to these problems in string theory. That is, you don't have to just look at the mathematics, which is kind of the scores, but you can see these visual images, which is like the playing of the mathematics. So we created a very special name for these images. We called them adinkras, A-D-I-N-K-R-A. This is a word that comes from West Africa, and it talks about, it, it's about a tradition of symbols with hidden meaning. But our symbols definitely had hidden mathematical meaning. And on the basis of that, uh, in 2020, here at Brown University, with some further elaborations on the initial ideas, I and two of my graduate students solved this problem that no one had solved in my field for over 40 years. And the problem involves answering 4.2 billion questions. That's amazing. That's amazing. And you're tapping into both sides of your brain. We talked about that. Yes, the well, you, you know, the analytical. thing about the brain that uh, mm -hmm. neuropsychologists tell us is that a large percentage of the information processing power of our human brain is actually tied up in processing visual information. Mm -hmm. So if you're turning mathematics into things that you can visualize, you have access to all of these things in you that are responsible for processing that kind of information. Wow. That's profound. <laughs> okay, so um, because of this wonderful research that you've been doing and other other areas that you've done research, you have been um, you've received certain distinctions, and one of them is uh, that 2013 you received a medal. Right, we discussed this, and I just wanted you to talk a little bit about meeting Obama, President sure. Obama, and sure. Yeah. So. Uh, in 2013, uh, I was awarded the uh, National Medal of Science. Everyone's heard about the National Medal of Honor, right? Because all of our soldiers, or the mm -hmm. National Medal of Arts, we're mm -hmm. in great for. But there is such an equivalent award for scientists, and it's this National Medal of Science. So in 2013, I was awarded the 2011 uh, medal, and you might wonder why the delay. Well, in 2012, President Obama was busy doing something called, called get, getting reelected, so <laughs> there was no ceremony. Right. Uh, but in 2013, they finally uh, uh, had the ceremony. And I think there were about 11 recipients uh, in, in my class. 
And uh, <clears throat> so I had been advising President Obama since 2009 or so. So I kind of, I had been in hours of meetings with this guy and had a sense of who he was as a person. So going into the ceremony, I, uh, about a week or two, maybe three before, I said, I should make a joke for this guy. A very personalized joke from the things that I know about his personality. But then two days beforehand, I said, nah, it's supposed to be very somber <laughs> and dignified, so I'm not going to tell my joke. Right. So I'm sitting there waiting to be called, and he said, and the, my name is called, and then he says, come get your award, Sylvester. Well, you see, nobody calls me Sylvester but my wife. <laughs> and she only does that when she's mad when at she's me. Upset, yeah. So that triggered in me the sort of the courage to tell him my joke. So when I got up on the stage, we're standing next to each other, and I lean over and whisper into his ear my joke, and he burst into laughter. He go I, I love that picture. I was stunned. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to so, enjoy the so joke that much. So what's the joke, Jim? Uh, it's politically incorrect. <laughs> And he's the only person in life that I have told this joke to, including my wife. So you're not going to hear no, it today. Not, okay. All right. We won't push that one. But it, it's, a, it's a nice photo of him laughing. Oh, uh, he saying. guffawed. I was, we did, neither of us knew there was a photographer over my shoulder who would oh. catch that picture. So it's a total surprise. Total surprise. Well, yeah. Maybe, maybe Obama will tell us one of these he, days. Well, like, if he remembers <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, if he remembers, yeah. Okay, so there were uh, other things. You mentioned the commercials that you've worked on. Let's talk a little bit about that. And you, how comfortable are you? Like, do you feel like an ambassador of science or in physics? Or? I don't know if I'm an ambassador. Um, I have, what I tell, well, what I tell people is two things. Uh, I was an extraordinarily shy child. Even into my teenage years, I was really shy. So the fact that I'm in front of the camera, that 12-year-old version of me still runs inside of my head. And so I always get nervous in front of the camera. But I've learned that I can get past that, that I can say things and do things that other people find of value and interesting. So uh, these commercials are examples of that. Some people simply out of the blue said, we'd like for you to do these commercials. And I'm like, Okay, yeah, that's something I haven't done. And so uh, I did two, I've done two commercials in my life. One for, uh, the first one was for Verizon. Something big has been erupting all around us, a renaissance of sorts, recognized by those that understand that they too are big. But to shape the universe that in turn shapes them, they must align with the best. The network that has the capacity to help them be the best. As it's not just about speed and reliability, it's about being a part of a movement that moves you. For best results, use Verizon. I was actually very pleased with the way it came out because that's the first time I had done that. And then I did a second commercial about a year later for TurboTax, and that one's more fun and lighthearted. Meet Marvin. Marvin thinks you have to be a brainiac to do your own taxes. So we brought in world-renowned brainiac Dr. S. James Gates Jr. to help him get started. Marvin. You got a W-2? Uh, yeah, I do. You got a finger? Yes. Take the finger and press it right here. Yay, you got it. Yay. Into it, TurboTax. Taxes done smarter. In both experiences, I got, you know, I had a chance to see a little bit how real performers have to interact with makeup and, and right. costume and, you know, the whole uh, camera lighting and all that. So it was a learning experience for me. And in the second one of these, I actually had my own mobile dressing room wow. with some makeup artists, two nice ladies. And when, they, when I met them, I said, forget it. You're not going to be able to help on this face. <laughs> so don't waste your time. But you looked great in a commercial. Well, so, I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah. My, it's always my goal not to scare uh, young children to small animals. Not at all, Jim. And you also mentioned that you lived in California, so you're similar to myself. You know, I, I also lived there for a little bit, and you're a little bit, you're more exposed to the film industry, right? You're, I'm not sure if I'm more exposed. I've done maybe f some something north of uh, a dozen film, uh, documentary films. Uh, right. So if that's exposure, yeah, I've seen a number of producers who do. Yeah, I remember uh, just watching, I was watching Nova, and I saw you, and I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> there, there yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah, I pop up fairly frequently. So it may be 20 or so. In fact, the <laughs> last documentary I filmed for has not aired here in the United States. It's something called Hawking, Can You Hear Me? 
Oh. It's been broadcast in England uh, mm -hmm. in 2021, but I don't think it's actually come to the U.S. yet. You know, we didn't even talk about this, but you were um, you were almost an astronaut, right? You were on. Yes, you were one of those I, listed yes, in the I, training. Yes, I, I applied to be an astronaut. Uh, a, a close friend of mine was Ronald McNair, who most people who have heard his name don't realize he's a PhD laser physicist. So Ron was a friend of mine in graduate school, and as I was leaving, as I was leaving Harvard to go to Caltech. He convinced me to apply, and I did. There are a whole nother set of stories about that that I could tell you. And do you also fly planes? Are you telling me? Not really. Joke, but or? No, no. I mean, I have, but it's more complicated. <laughs> it would oh. take some time. Okay, so um, I, I'm interested in hearing, like, where do you see the future of science going? Like, um, I remember there was a talk by uh, Richard uh, Feynman. Yes. That he gave, and the title was There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Yes. It really started, actually, it was given like in the 50s, but it wasn't until the 80s when nanotechnology came, you know, right. started um, uh, being the hot topic or hot research that yes. people started to read the book. And, yes. you know, I also read that. But for you, if you were to give that sort of talk now, what would you, what would you recommend for young minds? wanting to get into science, into string theory, or sure. into cosmology? Well, as you know, Angela, um, Richard Feynman led the research group I was in when I was at Caltech. So I actually have my own set of Feynman stories, which <laughs> is a whole sure you do. Another. He was a character. But yeah. he was quite a character. He was an amazing guy, yeah. uh, very supportive. Um, so, you know, I don't compare myself to Richard Feynman in any sense, and so it's a little bit embarrassing for you to ask that question, but I can make an attempt at an answer. And it goes something like this. Um, if I put aside my concerns about what my country is going through right now, because we're going through a, a unique time, and at least as I know in our history, and there are bad things that can come out of these things, like the turning off of science. This is something mm -hmm. I spoke about in 2005, is that science can be turned off. Hmm. And given the social, political things that I see evolving, science can be turned off. But let's put that aside. If we avoid these most terrible outcomes and people uh, who are, let's say, five and six now, or four, five, and six, which is the age I first heard about science, what would I tell them? I'd say a couple of things. One, um, you need to understand that computers are like eyeglasses for your mind. Mm. They let you absorb and manipulate mathematics at a scale you cannot imagine. There's a picture of me with my head superimposed on the Iron Man suit, and the quote is, uh, learning to use codes is like putting on the mathematic version of the Iron Man suit. So the first thing is, the human machine interface, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, yeah. you should be thinking about that because I'm convinced, and I have been convinced for a long time, that computers will allow mathematics to become more accessible to more people. They will, be, computers will become like musical instruments, right? Mm -hmm. You can play a musical instrument without knowing how to read scores. Mm -hmm. Computers are gonna let you do math without necessarily going through the traditional routes. I've said this, so this is one thing I think is very important. The other thing that, uh, I would sort of recommend to that four-year-old version of, uh, of me, if he was around right now, uh, is um, that our universe is a mystery, but it may have picked you to help solve that mystery. It's a very wow. personal and individualized relationship that as a scientist mm -hmm. you can develop in your life. And you shouldn't be afraid of that because I know certainly in my life there was a time when I feared, I knew what I wanted to do, but I feared that the universe wouldn't let me do it. And I would say mm. get past those fears, get past your personal fears. And um, the final thing, I guess, is the problem that super string theory uh, has attempted to make progress with, which is so-called quantum theory of gravity which will likely tie up with uh, entanglement and quantum information theory, I would say those are the places that 
I'd say that, tell that four-year-old version me, look to those places. That's mm -hmm. where opportunity is going to be. Mm. Do you, you know, just to go back to the second point, I was watching yesterday a um, video of uh, Denzel Washington. Yes. Giving, an, uh, it was for, um, he was receiving an honor. Yes. And he gave it some advice. Uh, do you think, and he, he said he was in a, a, his mom's salon, when it, uh, a beauty salon, Yes. when a woman walked over to him. I don't know, are you familiar with the story? No, no. And I told him, you're going to be a great, you're going to do, you're going to travel, you're going to do all these wonderful things. Do you think it's, it's almost innate in some of us to be fearful of greatness or to, to not embrace it and that could hinder? Or yeah. that? Well, first of all, uh, you're asking a theoretical question because <laughs> I have not achieved greatness. I can tell you that right off the bat. Um, well, close to greatness. Well, I'm not Will you accept I'm not, that? No, I won't accept <laughs> okay, that either. Okay, I'm just right. a, I'm just a guy who ditch ma digs mathematical ditches. That's all. Um, is it innate? Let me just put it this way: from my perspective, ours is a society that creates much fears for young people, mm. and uh, so to that degree that our society is not capable of creating childhoods and young adulthoods where large numbers, diverse numbers of people feel the possibility of becoming extraordinary across the broadest range of human activities, not just in athletics, but what humans do. That's what's innate as, I can, as far as I can tell. Mm. And, and we talked about uh, you know, your encouragement now, what you see in, in the way of diversity and inclusion and the equity, probably in another 30 years, that young um, indigenous person or Hispanic won't even have any of the obstacles. It's well, they may not have may not the have obstacles, any, yeah. but they might have even greater obstacles. The future can go both ways. Yeah, that's, that's the true. thing to realize. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Let's hope it goes in <laughs> more positive. One can, one can only hope because without hope, there is no future. Yeah, yeah. I, I thoroughly agree, and I've thoroughly enjoyed our time. I wish we could go on and on, no, <laughs> but you I don't. know you have, no, you don't. You you have go a to, lot to do. you got to go to sleep <laughs> at some point. So the last um, question I have is actually not a question, but um, just something I, I usually ask, you know, famous people, and they're full <laughs> of greatness. <laughs> okay, well, um, then I can walk out the door <laughs> if you only ask this question of famous people. So finish this sentence, you know, if I could do it all over again, I would. If I could do it all over again, I would be less afraid. I would also um, take more advantage of opportunities that I bypass. That's it. But you'd still be a physicist. Oh, absolutely. Are you we serious? Love that. <laughs> You've had so much fun thus far. So. Oh, it's uh, been a marvelous 71 years. and. I hope to have left behind some contributions that uh, ultimately will be seen to have been significant. Jim, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for the <laughs> opportunity. Let's try to do this again. <laughs> I'm uh, available. Brown is not a long drive away. It is so. not terribly far away from my. It's an hour plane ride. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. You're quite welcome, Angela. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, please email us at physicsfundamentals at gmail.com. Bye for now. <laughs>